Hello, welcome to the Brooklyn Book Festival. I am Lauren Christensen. Um, and I am an editor at the New York Times Book Review, and I'm really excited to welcome you to the 2022 Brooklyn Book Festival's Virtual Festival Day for a discussion with about reinventing the memoir with uh, the authors Margot Jefferson and Ingrid Rojas Contreras. Um, before we begin, I do want to let uh, everyone in the audience know that uh, the books by these authors will be uh, available for purchase in a link. Um, as well as uh, while we are speaking, please feel free to enter any questions you have um, in the Crowdcast sort of chat uh, box, and we will definitely save some time at the end to answer those. Um, so to welcome our guests, uh, the winner of a Pulitzer Prize for Criticism, Margot Jefferson previously served as a cultural critic for Newsweek and the New York Times. Uh, her writing has also appeared in Vogue, New York Magazine, The Nation, Guernica, and, and other publications. Uh, her 2015 memoir, Negroland, received the National Book Critics Circle Award uh, for autobiography. And she is also the author of a critical text called On Michael Jackson. Uh, and she's a professor of writing at Columbia University. Her latest memoir is Constructing a Nervous System. And Ingrid Rojas Contreras uh, was born and raised in Bogota, Colombia. Her debut novel, Fruit of the Drunken Tree, was the silver medal winner for in first fiction uh, from the California Book Awards uh, and a New York Times editor's choice. Uh, her, her essays and short stories have appeared in the Times Magazine and The Believer, among other publications. And she now lives in California, where she is joining us from. And her latest book is, of course, the memoir, The Man Who Could Move Clouds. Welcome to both of you. It's so nice to see you in, in sort of person. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Thank you. So happy to be here. It is very good to be here. <laughs> so I just wanted to start by, you know, your your books. I mean, it's it's as this title of the this talk, uh, reinventing the memoir, suggests. You know, you've both written memoirs that are uh, un untraditional in in different ways, uh, non traditional. Um, so to give the audience a sense of your really distinct voices, I'd love to just ask you to read you know, passages uh, from from both of your books, um, if you don't mind. We could start with uh, Margot and then go to Ingrid. Thank you. I stood in a bright, harsh light. The stage was bare. I extended my arm, no, flung, hurled it out, pointed an accusatory finger, then turned to an unseen audience and declared, this is the woman with only one childhood. It was part of the night's dream work, and I was rattled when I woke up, for I'd been addressing myself. My tone was harsh and that outstretched arm with its accusing finger had the force of the moment in melodrama when the villain, hitherto successful in his schemes to ruin the heroine's life, is revealed, condemned, and ready for punishment. I understood what I had to do. At the end of his stage show, Bill Bojangles Robinson would look up at the lighting booth and shout, give me a light, my color. Pause, then blackout. When the light returned, I knew it was time to construct another nervous system. For most of my adult life, I felt that to become a person of complex and stirring character, a person, as I put it, of inner consequence, I must break myself into pieces, hammer, saw, chisel away at the unworthy parts, then rebuild. It was laborious, like stone masonry. And on the stone masonry model, the human self says, go on. It admires itself for saying, go on, and proceeds to go on. As I went on, I grew dissatisfied. This edifice was too fixed. I wanted it to become an apparatus of mobile parts, parts that fuse, burst, fracture, cluster, hurdle, and drift. I wanted to hear its continuous thrum, thrum through the materials of my life. Chosen, imposed, inherited, made up. I imagined it as a nervous system, but not the standard biological kind. It was an, an assemblage. 
My nervous system is my structure of recombinant thoughts, memories, feelings, sensations, and words. Repeat after me. It's time to construct another nervous system. You write criticism, you write memoir. What will be your tactics, strategies, instruments for constructing this nervous system? I keep carping and fussing, rearing up against the words critic and criticism, such august temperate words. They make me think Gertrude Stein was right. Nouns are boring because all they do is name things. And just naming things is all right when you want to call a role that isn't good for anything else. When you're thrilled by a flying buttress, a sound chamber of notes and syllables, when an idea makes you feel as if the top of your head were being taken off, then abandon your too temperate prose zone and keep writing criticism. As for memoir, I keep attaching adjectives to it. Cultural memoir, temperamental memoir. What makes me so anxious? I want memoir and criticism to merge. Can they? And if so, how? Read on. There's no escaping the stuff of memory and experience. Dramatize it, analyze it, amend it accidentally, remake it intentionally. Call it temperamental autobiography. Be a critic of your own prose past. Remember, memoir is your present, negotiating with versions of your past for a future you're willing to show up in. Thank you. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you. Ingrid. Uh, yeah. Um, so I'm going to read this section where I'm, I'm going back and forth um, talking. I, ha I had an accident and I got amnesia from it um, in 2007. Um, and I go back and forth between that accident and when my mother was young, when she was a child, when she was eight years old, she had an accident and she lost her memory. So this is a part of the book where I go back and forth telling the two accidents at the same time. Um, so at this point, when I'm reading, I, it's, I have just kind of um, hit a car when I was biking and I've just kind of um, stood up from the ground and don't fully understand yet that I have amnesia. And my mother uh, is, is kind of in a coma and she's, um, they're not, you know, her family's not able to kind of wake her up. At the intersection, I got off my bike and stared, mesmerized, at the street signs, Madison, Halstead, not only did I not recognize the names, it suddenly dawned on me. I had no idea where I came from or where I was going, what city I was in, what my name was, and I did not even know the year. Somewhere, somehow, this struck me as funny, nay, hilarious. Was I laughing out loud? I have reached out to stop someone to ask them the year, and if they didn't freak out, maybe the city. But I pulled back in a giggle, thinking, this is life imitating, life imitating. I did not know how the rest of that sentence went. Then a man I recognized as the one who had just flung his car door in front of me, passed me by, whistling in his coat and hat, walking a small white poodle. Then a sentence popped into my head the way words sometimes do of their own volition just pop into your mind. All good science fiction begins this way. It's a story where it was on the tip of my tongue, but I couldn't focus because I was raging with electricity. I was air packed together in sheer consciousness. I closed my eyes. I gave in to the current. I exulted in the street corner. There was the noise of traffic, the bustling of people. I was euphoria standing in place. When I opened my eyes, how much time had passed, all appeared to be the same, people waiting, then crossing at the red light, cars going, cars idling. I am so, I feel so. There was nothing to do but wait for this wave of devotion to pass. Devotion to what? I closed my eyes. I am so, I feel so. 
I only knew the things my body told me, that there had been a before, a place where I had borne some unidentifiable weight on my shoulders and chest, and that there was a now, a dizzying, unbounded place where I had laid my burdens down. You are now a blank slate, I told myself, then tried to remember what a blank slate was. An understanding settled on me like mist. It was the state of being born into the world new and untouched by experience and time. A bad strap was digging into my shoulder. I considered the bag. It was white and worn with little printed stars. I knew it contained clues to my old life. So I took it off and strode to the trash can. I remembered that there was such a thing as the ocean. I would throw the bag away, I decided, go to a port scan my way onto a boat and out on the water where no questions would be asked, I would continue living as a blank slate. I raced the bag over the trash. Then I made eye contact with a woman through a glass storefront. At lightning speed, I understood the glance I had just given her, non-committal, arrogant, I had given to myself. I was looking at my reflection in a darkened window. I was a woman. My hair was black and in disarray. I watched with astonishment as my own eyes, harried, unbelieving, wide open, communicated back to me every inch and ebb of what I was feeling. People walked around me, staring through me like I wasn't even there, like a miracle was not just unfolding before all of our eyes because it felt miraculous, the seeing of myself for the first time. I inched to the window, I examined my face, the thick eyebrows, the brown skin, the white nose, what heritage is written on that face? South American, Middle Eastern, Caribbean? I had no idea. I ran my finger across my brow, caressed my own cheek, played with my hair. God, my eyebrows are so thick. I started to panic. It was proving difficult to remain a blank slate. I needed never to look at a mirror again, but it was addicting seeing myself. I glanced, then looked then gazed into my own iris. It was brown and where light streaked in caramel gold. What a strange fortress it was. I was patient and serene, wondering what key, what code might help me break the lock. Then like turning a corner, I was terrified, choking. Air was mud stuck in my throat. Soon my mind would unhinge and open to madness. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw people crossing the street to avoid me. That was me screaming. That was me dropping to my knees, gasping for breath. That was me, a threadbare thing, fixing my nails into the crack of the pavement, laughing, latching on to a little piece of the world. Every day, mommy's mother, Nona, sat next to mommy's cot. Every week, she clipped the growing nails of mommy's fingers and toes, cut them out of stringy hair that fell over her chest, Mommy's father, Nono, cleansed Mommy's wounds, pulled the split skin that had puckered to lay it flat once more on her face. He plastered her skin with mashed petals and seeds and saps from trees and tinctures so it would heal without scarring. When Mommy at last opened her eyes, the dim light of the room assaulted her, but not more so than the strangers at her bedside, the young girl, girls and boys and pregnant women who she did not recognize and who looked at her with such alarm and repulsion, Mommy at once feared what they saw. Her hands flew to her cheeks, her fingertips met with soft pads of gauze, her whole face was wrapped. The little boys pressed Mommy's hands down against the bed, imploring her not to touch anything, and the pregnant woman with her bulging stomach crowded what little space Mommy had. Mommy kicked and wept. She screamed for a mirror and for answers. Who were they? What did they want? Why were they holding her captive? She screamed until she passed out. Wow. Thank you both so much for that. Um, hopefully the audience yeah, has a sense of, of, of the, you know, real distinction between these, these two voices and these two books. But I, I'm also really struck by you know, how you both are engaging this act. It's, it's a kind of meta uh, act of like examining yourself, examining your lives, um, you know, for, for various reasons. Um, Margot, I'm 
really I'm glad you you read the beginning of the book um, it's, it's I think, literally the opening yeah, yeah it, it it you know just introduces this really interesting opposition between the two genres of memoir and criticism which of course are the two genres that you are most perhaps <laughs> known for writing um and and can you talk about you know how the tensions you see between those two genres um and, and how this book really set out to resolve, negotiate uh, between those two sides of yourself, those, the sides of, of your thinking, your consciousness? Well, I suppose I should start um, very briefly with um, my last memoir, Negro Land. Um, I, I wanted, um, which criticism does not do and which um, memoir um, can do, I wanted to try all, you know, dialogue and confession and, you know, fractured sequences and, and voices for different persona. Um, but I was just, you know, throwing pieces together and magpieing um, until I realized that I was trying to write without my critic's voice and that the critic is at this point such an integral part of my sensibility that that had to be a dramatic and narrative element. So that was step one. Um, after that book, and I and I called it a cultural memoir. I, I didn't title it that, too, too wordy, but, but I did. Um, after that, um, I wanted to go further in that those criticism can certainly have elements of autobiography, and one could say everything we, you know, we think or care about or loving or hating is a is in some way um, some version of autobiography, but um, the memoir you are maybe abashedly, but basically unabashedly, absolutely um, narrating the story. You're responsible to yourself, everything, and you know, to your material, but everything you bring in is emanating from yourselves, I should say, because you know, as Ingrid read, I was thinking again that the the narrating memoir self is in many cases multiple selves. Um, um, anyway, so uh, what I wanted to do more, I thought, would it be possible without calling it official criticism to write a memoir entirely through the objects, experiences, you know, this piece of material culture, that piece of art culture, this, you know, television show, this whatever, the things that are our um, inner soundtrack, our, <laughs> our inner um assemblages, um, those, all those things that make up in some way your sensibility and temperament. Um, what ended up happening, of course, which, which worked out was that each of these, whether it was, you know, Bud Powell or Ella Fitzgerald or a Willa Cather novel or each of, or I can Tina Turner, they all core, invoked, evoked, set off, um, set, in, set off charges inside of more um, traditional memoir narrative, which is, you know, here's, here are my parents, here is this particular racial, class, gender um, set of necessities and inventions that I, that I am part of. But they, they can't really, they, they are like a, collabor a musical collaboration, the, 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 the particulars of engagement, loving um, some kind of art or hating it, and your own, you know, the material, the more sociological, cultural material of memoir. So I wanted to wed them and see what that would release. Yeah, and you know, Ingrid, it, it, yours too is this kind of hybrid genre. Uh, like, you know, it's it's obviously memoir, but there are elements that I traditionally associate with fiction brought in. Like, I mean, because it's such so sort of so many spiritual elements. There's, you know, magical realism. Uh, there's this kind of uncanny doubling and tripling and quadrupling. I mean, the, you, you know, the the mirroring of your mother and and yourself. Uh, you know, aesthetically, and also in terms of this experience, um, how how were you using genres to kind of expand what a memoir could mean? Yeah, um, thank you so much. Um, and I I love um, Margot's point about the mo multiple selves narrating in in memoir. Um, I I think for this story, 
maybe like the the activating experience that brought me to the book was my own experience of amnesia. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it was it was this experience of, um, you know, getting uprooted from identity. And then, after, you know, I, I was with amnesia for a period of eight weeks. And after that, my memories returned. And so when my memories returned, what I remembered was I, you know, had gone through just this very surreal, very kind of like sci-fi like experience. And then when my memory returned, what what those were were that I remembered that my grandfather was a was a curandero or like a traditional um, healer, and that people said that he could move clouds, and that my mother had also been a curandera and she had a psychic business in our house and she treated people with you know um, praying over water and then giving them water, um, and so the things that I was also remembering were you know part of you know that that kind of like magical reality that sounds like it's um magical realism um that we kind of associate in fiction so in when you know in in trying to find my way into into writing the book what I tried to do was to be as faithful as possible to what my experience of the surreal is and then just tell it from from that point. So I, throughout the memoir, I just tried to remain rooted in the unexplained or remain rooted in that that part of reality that feels like it's um, rejecting definition or that it's unstable and that we can't quite find our footing in it. We can't quite tell what life is made out of. To me, that that part of reality was, was so interesting. And so I, when I was writing the book, um, I just, I was reaching for those types of um, stories that would kind of, you know, help me get there. And as I also, as I was doing research for the book, one of the things that I did was I was trying to find my family's lineage. So I was just trying to do a traditional family tree and then found that the, the, you know, the archive itself was also not a place where I where I was able to find answers. I went back to Ocaña, where my, in this village where my family is from in Colombia, and I was looking through baptismal records trying to find my grandfather's parents, and I did, and then I I couldn't find my way up after that because the records are patrilineal, mm. and his his parents were you know bastard children so they they didn't have the the last name of the father and I couldn't very easily find my way back so I kept asking for older and older books and at some point I was given this book um that you know was among like the oldest that they had at this baptismal um record office and when I tilted the book up it um it just it 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 became dust like it the book disintegrated and so it was just like this literal i can't find like this story is just resisting me finding factual you know factual like traces of it and so i had to rely on um memory and i you know relied a lot of on interviews and um, had many interviews with my mother about what amnesia was like for her and then tried to remember what amnesia was like for me. So yeah, so it was just, it was going into this, it was, it just, everything that happened in the book was just kind of, you know, from the events of it to the research of it was just resisting a traditional model. And that kind of splintering of that book, of that, of those literal you know, his history and memory just being unavailable and just kind of not, you know, not existing anymore, that shattering. uh, It it reminds me, you know, very much of of what what you were doing, Margo, just, uh, you know, the the act of constructing a nervous system really, it also feels like a, like a, uh, like a shattering into pieces and then kind of picking up each tiny little piece and examining that and that one by one. It's true. And seeing where it will lead you and knowing you don't know in advance, yeah. you know, at all. Um, you know, it, this has so much to do with how structure we talk about with books. But I, I 
whoa, <laughs> I had to um, allow myself to be at the mercy of, um, of associations, um, of memories that were probably in terms of how you remember scenes with, with a parent, with a sibling, with something you watched and felt passionate about um, in what company. I had to accept that um, in that way, memory is as much invention um, and, you know, impassioned um, or obsessive, you know, um, recreation um, as real. So I, I would um, work to make sure that, um, you know, for example, the, you know, an Ella Fitzgerald or a, or a Bud Powell, that they were surrounded with enough um, of, you know, the, the critical research or the historian's research with enough fact um, so that I was not dominating them, not imposing my, my inventions and associations and my narrative onto them, but was finding um, entryways for it. So we could, we, could, we could be in polyphonic or at least dialogic. Mm -hmm. I, I actually hadn't known that Ella Fitzgerald as a teenager was sent to a, an institution for young girls for young like wayward girls for you know wayward we all know billy holiday was but no one you know she conducted herself in such a way as to keep it very distant but i was very happy to find that research mm -hmm. you know that that had been done by journalists in fact in yeah. Yeah. And it's the kind of research you wouldn't normally find in a memoir about someone who's or yeah, in a memoir. Know, it was, it was in one of the, no, that's true. Yeah. But, you know, it turned out I was much more merged with her in various ways in terms of women becoming artists, which kept, mm -hmm. keeps emerging in the book, whether it's mm -hmm. Willa Cat or Ella Fitzgerald or, you know, or then the men that one became obsessed with and didn't quite realize it. <laughs> right. Ike Turner, no. <laughs> it's just cool that you can, you know, be, be writing about yourself while, you know, going on for paragraphs and par about, about another person without actually, you know, injecting yourself. It's still that that connection is really implied and it, and it carries through. Um, and Ingrid, I mean, one of the parts that, that I keep thinking about is when you remember this black dress that you you'd bought um, and your mother had warned you when, when you showed it to her really excitedly, like, don't wear that, it's going to make you a, a widow. Uh, and, and, and you remembered that after, were you going to get the dress altered or something while, when you got into the bike accident? And, yeah, and, yeah th that connection between widowhood and, um, and amnesia. Oh, yeah, sorry. I think I, the video froze for a minute. Oh, um, yeah, I, it was, it was a dress that I, the moment that I saw it, and it was this black very wang gown, and it was on sale, and it was, you know, very cheap, and so I was just convinced that I had to buy it, and I, you know, would figure it out later. Um, so I bought this dress, and I took it to the seamstress, and I had taken a photo of it and then sent it to my mother and she in an email and she immediately started to make international phone calls to my cell phone so I knew I knew that it was a serious thing and I answered the phone and she said stay away from the stress the stress you know is it has like something bad is going to happen around it um just you know don't you know just just get rid of the dress like don't but I had already kind of dropped it off at the seamstress and I was very much in love with this dress and there wasn't one percent of me that was going to listen to what she was saying <laughs> um and you know I I I, I said like I yeah I, I heard what you said but I you know um and I got the phone call from the seamstress and I that's when I got on my bike and then I was biking on my way there to pick up the dress when somebody opened their car door into the bike lane and I crashed and that was the accident that gave me amnesia um so yeah it's the curious thing about memory and obsession um I don't know how that you know how this happens but one of the I couldn't remember my name who I was just anything about me um and but I could remember this dress like I could remember what this dress looked like 
Um, and when I when I had Amisha, it was one of my obsessions was trying to find this dress and kind of get it back. Um, but yeah, I when when I remember she she at some point I, I think it had been maybe like two days after the accident. Um, and my mother called on my on my cell phone and the screen just said mommy and I answered the phone and she just started to speak to me in, in Spanish. And that was the first moment that I realized that I spoke Spanish. So no, nowhere before that had I remembered that Spanish was the language that I that I spoke, or even that it was my first tongue. Like I had no idea until that moment. Um, and while her voice sounded familiar, you know, she was still kind of talking about this dress and how I needed to kind of get away from this dress. I couldn't remember what she looked like or just anything about her. I couldn't remember what our relationship was together. But the moment that she mentioned the dress, I was like, oh, the dress. And just like <laughs> imagined like the gown. Um, and then I remembered what she had said about, you know, this dress is going to turn you into a widow. And there, yeah, there was there was something just fascinating about that moment of, of rece receiving kind of a warning mm -hmm. and then the prophecy also being off you know like it wasn't that oh, I nice. it, it wasn't that I lost a husband but it was that I kind of lost myself just I just lost a, a, a version of myself um, and even post amnesia I became someone else which I think happens to a lot of people who who lose their memories that after you kind of your personality shifts a little bit, you become someone else, um, which is strange. <laughs> um, and yeah, but but it also didn't feel like she was saying like, this is a bad thing that's going to happen. And I remember being on the phone with her and thinking, this is the best thing that has ever happened to me in my life, you know? So I wasn't so I think that was also like, I still have this dress. Um, I was about, that's what I wanted to ask. You went back to the dress. I went back when to you the got dress. your memory back and got the dress. Yeah, so I still, I still have this dress. I wore it one time while I was drafting um, one of the, one of that section where I was writing about amnesia, I wore the dress to kind of access. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would sometimes do that if I was writing about another period, another world, another, you know, or music versus literature or which kind of music I would, the clothing, the music I would pick, you know, yeah. at the soundtrack. Yes, yes, absolutely. Because, I mean, your, your accident is just a very extreme example of something that's true for everyone, certainly writing memoir and everyone who's just remembering their past is that there are gaps right there are like there are gaps there are errors there's you know facts missing from the ledgers when you go back to to find things so that that process of construction to use yeah. to use margot's word is really always present whether you know yeah. even if it looks like a linear kind of yeah actual narrative it's always you know yeah I, this was even just very clear to me as my memory started to come back because i I really started to see how a self is manufactured. Mm -hmm. um, and even though I was receiving the same facts that I that I had before, you know, that make up my identity and who I uh, who, who I am and how I understand my past, um, the order in which they came was different. So I didn't remember things chronologically. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the, the things that I didn't remember for a long time until after it was one of the, the things that I remembered last was that my mother had never wanted me to share that my grandfather was a curandero or that people said that he could move clouds or that she was a curandera. So I only remembered that the last thing. Um, and I think by that point, I had already made a different relationship to my family and then the stories that we tell and the culture that we come from um, that didn't involve shame. So mm -hmm. this kind of idea of like, you have to keep this life secret um, and nobody can know because, you know, there will be judgment around it or, you know, whatever will happen. Um, just didn't, it didn't fit in my life anymore. Um, and there was kind of a historical 
um, you know, uh, for us in, in many South American um, countries during our colonization, when you had people of mixed heritage, so, you know, for us, it would be mestizos half indigenous or like half Spanish or like half African, half Spanish people, because you were half Spanish, if you practice the traditions that you came from, um, you're like black or indigenous traditions, then they, they would say that this was um, witchcraft and you were only allowed to practice, you know, Catholicism. Um, and so all of those traditions became secret in the mixed, um, in the mixed um, identity people. And so the, you know, hundreds of years later, my mother saying like, don't share this story with anyone had to do with that historical, um, you know, persecution at the hands of like the, the Spanish Inquisition. Um, yeah, trying to kind of keep people quiet. I think that whole business of what you is communicated to you about shame, I always reverberate <laughs> the word shame, um, you know, embarrassment, shame, grief, it always comes at first in the family in this private way. It's, it's a mother, it's a, often a mother, um, maybe a father saying, do this, don't do that, never. And then, you know, it, it, the, the history begins to unfold um, and it's, you know, it's racial, it's gender, it's, yeah, yeah. And then you follow those, you follow those lines, but you know, it's two sets of um, two kinds of, of experience and, and recall and emotional um, response. And, you know, it, yeah. it makes me think of in Negroland too, you wrote about, I mean, just how race is, you know, constructed in this way. And there, there, there are just obvious parallels between that idea of uh, construction and manufacturing of a social, uh, social order, social systems with uh, a self, right? Like, you know, that kind of, um, self delusion that we had one childhood is, is kind of as uh, yeah. imaginary. And also that, um, you know, the if you had a childhood in which you were playing a number of roles, which in my oh. childhood certainly had to do with, you know, class um, and race, and when you were in a particular kind of white setting, and when you were in various different kinds of black settings, which weren't, you know, they didn't all require the same thing. Um, those are all, you learn those roles, you accept the constructions, or you find tiny little ways to rebel, or, or maybe big ways. I clearly didn't you know, just tear it all apart. But what I wanted to say was, what I wanted construction to be here was um, the, 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 the license and the um, particularity that, um, let's say, an artist has in constructing a composition or a piece of sculpture. So I, I wanted it to have meaning um, and a kind of liberation beyond that definition, you know, that sociological historical definition we now use of the constructed by outside forces self. So I was trying to give the word more, um, more freedom mm. because There's artists do construct their own, their own, yeah, yeah. There's also, I, I felt like I was watching the, the artist, like a painter describe to me how he was, he or she was painting the canvas. You know, there, there, there was a real um, self-monitoring, but that sounds just self-awareness of, of, you know, what was going into the craft for you. Um, the sense that it, of, of course it's subjective, but uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm curious how, that you know. sounds true for Ingrid also. Yeah. Both of you, yes, yeah. definitely. Very, very consciousness, but also knowing what you have to let yourself go free for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah did either of you feel like um, any kind of hesitation to, to kind of, <laughs> of memoir? Uh oh. I, mean, I always feel like <laughs> hesitation. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm the person who said, I was brought up not to write memoir because we were always supposed to survey, put yeah. under surveillance um, how um, mm. accounts of who we were, especially racially, but very much also in terms of gender, black women, the ways in which history and memory could obviously work against us. So we had to be 
scrutinizing and censoring when need be. Um, you know, the, always those threats of other um, narratives and imposing mm -hmm. on us. So, you know, and also memoir could reveal things that would look bad yeah. for, the, for your people, for the race, for the class. So, mm -hmm. you know, I had to make that struggle a part of what I was doing rather than pretend it wasn't there or rather than give in to it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And in Ingrid's case, like, you know, you said your, your mother didn't want some certain things shared and, and also just the idea that, you know, you're, we're all trying to impose a kind of narrative on our lives, right? Like there, it, it's comfortable for a human to just to say like, this happened and this happened and this happened. And, you know, was it, was it hard to force yourself beyond those boundaries, Ingrid, like for um, all that you didn't know? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I think that if if I hadn't had amnesia, I probably, I don't know that I would have written this book. So interesting. You know, like it just, it really made it possible for me to do it. Um, I think for me, just once I, I, I had like this second recollection of my life, um, I started to, to think about how I only have seen curanderos, um, unless academically, but only in fiction books. And I hadn't kind of seen um, a, a memoir, you know, like a creative kind of like nonfiction telling that was a personal account of that. Um, and maybe, yeah, I, I hadn't seen something that fully did it. So I, I just really wanted with with this book, I there was a silence, I think, that I was trying to break both for, for my family um, and just to have that story out there. Um, I, I think that one of, the, I, one of the conversations that I had with my mother as I was writing this book was about silence and who is the silence protecting. Mm -hmm. So I kind of kept asking her, you know, when when we say like this is not a story that we're supposed to say or tell, is like who is who are we protecting by this? Um, and you know, I as she was kind of talking about her her fears of it, I I just understood or heard the historical echoes of it, where if you were found out to be a curandero, maybe you would have been snatched and you would have been sent to the palace of Inquisition, where you would have been tortured, perhaps, you know, burnt at the stake. Um, and so there was all of this fear and hiding. Um, and, you know, so I, I can understand that the, the silence at some point had a had a use, there was a use to it, the use was survival. Um, and, yeah, and so I, we had this conversation where we just kind of came to the conclusion that we weren't sure what that silence was protecting now. Um, and the other thing that silence can do is that it just keeps you isolated. Um, and one of my favorite things with with writing this book is that I, you know, after after a reading, I might hear from a lot of Latinx people who who will come up and say, like, my mother was a curandera or my grandmother was a curandera, and I've never told that to anyone. Okay. Um, you know, and so for me, that just feels it it feels that I just I wanted to celebrate what those you know what what you know what what those stories are and again like that experience of like surreality and and stories that are rejecting like traditional modes of telling like how do we actually tell them um yeah so i think i've i've always just been in love with with those stories even as a young person so i'm i'm glad that i found a, a way to do it but yeah my I really think that the way that I got there was through amnesia. Which you described as the best thing that happened to you. Like, yeah. <laughs> that it was this positive thing. And, and I got the sense in the book that there was this freedom in it. Can you can you talk a little bit about that? You know, in the in the time that you actually couldn't remember things yet. Yeah. Was the freedom in it. There was, you know, one one of the fascinating things about not having a memory is the realization that your body also carries memory. Mm -hmm. um, and so even though I didn't have, you know, memory in my brain, I guess, there, there was a time when I, I met someone who I had known before, but I, I couldn't remember who they were. But when he went to hug me, my, my head just found a place in the nook of his shoulder that my body remembered that I did not remember. 
you know, it was just kind of like an automatic, like, oh, we do this and I do this, mm-hmm. you know, and it was just this body knowledge thing. Um, and so in the same way, I had a body memory of kind of being a very anxious person. And, you know, later I would, I would kind of like realize like, oh, I, I have like PTSD and I had, I grew up in like, um, violent time in Colombia and so that you know I have an anxiety disorder and there was like all of these things that my body um I could tell that there was like some tension but when all the memories were gone it was just like this very light um experience of myself um and it it was just a very beautiful I uh, living second to second with no thoughts to entertain myself because I didn't have any past or anything to think about or anything to regret it was just this beautiful what is the mind and you know I'm I'm alive and I'm watching myself and you know here is sunlight coming through the window and just an appreciation of like the beauty around me and the the strangeness of being inside a body and you know your body being this instrument that you go around the world and you know experience the world in um So it was, I was supremely, I was, I think I was the happiest that I've ever been, (laughs) you know, so it was a very joyful experience for me. Sounds almost idyllic. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Kind of like that process, Margo, just starting from the beginning, you know, like, okay, let's just shatter ourselves completely. Let's shatter the self completely and start again. Yeah, exactly. And so damn dutiful. Yes, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) I think we are coming up on time um unless anyone has a question I've gone over (laughs) the allotted question time so if anyone I'm not getting a sense that we have three questions here but if anyone wants to wants to throw one in at the last minute um otherwise both of you it's just it's been such an honor and uh and a real pleasure to talk to you um your books are incredible. Everyone who hasn't read them yet should should really uh, run out and get them. Uh, in addition to Negro Land and Fruit of the Drunken Tree, um, these these authors are, uh, are are really have a lot to teach us. So thank you, thank you both for being here on a Sunday afternoon. It's so nice to oh, see you. Wow. This, thank you, Lauren and Ingrid. What a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you, Margo. Yeah, and thank you, Lauren. This was so wonderful. And I, yeah, I loved this conversation. This Me morning. too. Thank you so much. Me too. Um, so to our audience, thank you all for being here. Um, and please, obviously, remember, you can uh, order these these books in the link below. Um, and also, please consider making a donation to the Brooklyn Book Festival, uh, which is celebrating its 17th year of presenting free literary programming. Um, and a reminder, if you're in New York City next week, uh, the, in, the in-person portion of this festival will take place uh, in downtown Brooklyn on October 2nd. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Have a nice weekend. Bye, everybody.